we appreciate your time with us, and at this time, I'd like to hand over our webinar to Chief Justice Durham, our featured presenter and moderator for our discussion. Thank you very much, Kate. I'd like to begin our discussion today by providing some context, and I'm going to ask staff to uh, put up on the screen a number of uh, slides that will that that I'll track in my remarks. But I wanted to say a word about history. From my perspective as a Chief Justice in my own state and working with state courts around the country in the context of the Conference of Chief Justices and the National Center for State Courts, I don't think anything more significant in the way of criminal justice reform has come our way ever than the movement towards evidence-based sentencing. Whereas for years we looked at the theoretical basis of sentencing theory, incapacitation or deterrence, rehabilitation and retribution, uh, sentencing practices throughout the states swung back and forth between those theories with not necessarily a lot of um, progress. One of the things that happened about 30 years ago is that the pendulum swung very far in the direction of using incarceration and relying on retribution values as the driving values in corrections. However, as the rates of incarceration went up, we did not necessarily see concomitant reductions in crime, particularly reductions that could be attributed to incarceration as opposed uh, to changes in demographics. So let's talk a little bit about current sentencing um, policies in the context of reform objectives. Uh, the Chief Justices conducted a survey, or, or rather the National Center surveyed the Chief Justices several years ago in connection with Roger Warren's project and tried to identify whether there was uniform focus on sentencing reform objectives. And it, those, that consensus did emerge in the survey. The first uh, objective is to promote public safety and to reduce recidivism, and of course those two are related very closely, through using evidence-based practices, namely programs that work and rely on offender risk and needs assessment tools. Uh, that was the first major goal. The second was to promote the development, funding, and utilization of community-based alternatives to incarceration for appropriate offenders. So on today's panel, for example, we've got court administration, uh, the judge side, and the, the uh, Board of Pardons and Parole side, but also community corrections represented. Uh, and we hope that in the discussion we'll be talking about the overlap between all of those elements of the system. The principles of evidence-based practices uh, are fairly straightforward, and I would strongly encourage uh, all of the participants in this to spend some time with the white paper that's part of the boxed uh, set here, because these principles are discussed at length and the empirical research underlying them are included. Uh, but you, you see here a visual representation of those principles. And you start if you start down at the bottom, uh, I made reference earlier to the need for, for proper assessments of risk and need. And we're going to be talking about how that plays out in terms of the, in, of the instruments we choose. Then you've got to figure out a way to plug in to what we know about human beings and how they make changes in their lives and to enhance their motivation to do so. You've got to look at target intervention for specific problems uh, that may be related with risk and need in an individual offender. And then you've got to have uh, resources that will enable you to train people in the skills they need in a, an actual applied setting. We all know that most human beings make changes in their lives by incorporating changes in their behavior and repeating that behavior. And then, of course, they need positive reinforcement for that behavior, and they need ongoing support systems. So let's move for a minute and look at the kinds of policy initiatives. I'm assuming from the survey and the uh, large numbers of county and state-based participants on the webinar today that we've got a lot of people who are working through local criminal justice uh, settings. And one of the things that evidence-based sentencing reform has looked at is are, are the things that 
that um, judges can do. Judges, of course, perform something of what we call a convening role in their communities. And what that really means is that when judges call the local prosecutor's office, the local probation and parole people, um, the county commissioners, or the state legislators who may be responsible for funding, and ask them to come to a table for discussion. They do. So here are some of the initiatives that judges can pursue through working on the development of these kinds of, of um, policy teams throughout the community. Uh, first of all, helping to work on the, the enhancement of community-based programs that are devoted to corrections reform. Second, uh, developing, again, community-based intermediate sanctions that are appropriate to the nature of the offense and the offender risk. One of the things we know from the empirical research that we now have available is that um, we over-incarcerate some offenders and actually increase their risk of recidivism. And at the same time, we under-incarcerate others. And one of the reasons we do that is because we have so few choices in the community as alternatives uh, to incarceration. A third thing that judges can pursue is to help get the accurate and relevant sentencing data and information to the people who are working on these problems. And then, of course, something that I have cared very much about in my career and think is absolutely essential, and that is that people have got to understand what the data say and what the research shows and to be educated on how to do their jobs. So let's talk, uh, let's move up from the local level um, teams to the idea of state level barriers that can be addressed in individual jurisdictions. Uh, one thing is simply shifting our form of thinking about this problem and thinking about the idea of reducing risk in the form of recidivism as an explicit policy. It underlies much of what we think and talk about in sentencing, but it's not always explicit. Uh, then the second thing, and this can get very political, it certainly is in my jurisdiction when we're working on these problems, and that is ensuring that state sentencing policy allows sufficient flexibility so that you can implement these strategies. That, of course, requires educating legislators and using the da data and the results to persuade them that this is the direction in which we have to move. Then, of course, we need state corrections uh, policies to be a part of this change uh, and have the correction system buy into evidence-based data and to intermediate sanctions. And finally, we need to get our offender-based data and sentencing support systems in, in line to support what we're doing. I started with suggesting that uh, what is emerging in the form of evidence-based sentencing policy and information is perhaps uh, the most significant move in criminal justice, I think, in a century. We're focused on what works, and what works is increasingly coming to be seen as the necessary driving force in criminal justice, as opposed to the abstract philosophies and theories about sentencing that we have engaged in for a long time. So thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I think we are ready now uh, for another poll. This will precede our discussion of the um, panelists. We want to poll the audience, first of all, on whether your state has mandatory minimum sentencing. So would you participate now in that poll? And while you're selecting your responses, I just wanted to remind you that anytime you can submit questions through the question box on your screen. So that data on the results of this question should be coming up. And it appears uh, that 71% of you live in states where you have mandatory minimum sentencing, as I do in my own state with respect to at least some offenses, which suggests the overwhelming nature of, of the move that I think movement in the last 30 years that has overtaken criminal corrections. And that's the idea 
that judges should have less rather than more discretion. Uh, knowing this information about where you are in your own locations, I want to pose a few questions to our panelists today to help you, the audience, gain additional insight into the work that's going on around the country 